A group of Nintendo contract workers have come forward to call out a lousy corporate culture, unfair treatment, and rampant demoralization within the house that Mario built. In a new report from IGN, a dozen testimonies from current and former employees say that a growing disparity in the treatment between full-time and contract workers is the source of widespread discontent at Nintendo. Going back a little, you might remember a couple weeks ago, there was a labor complaint filed by a former Nintendo employee claiming that the company violated the National Labor Relations Act by violating the employee's legally protected right to unionize. Reportedly, this employee spoke about unions in a business meeting while employed by Nintendo and then was subsequently fired mid-contract. Nintendo clapped back to the accusations of union busting, saying they weren't aware of any attempts to unionize and that the employee was actually fired for the disclosure of confidential information. This response caused other contractors to speak up about the working conditions at Nintendo, who told Kotaku the social media post that got the employee who filed the labor complaint fired was actually extremely vague and would have under normal circumstances constituted a warning. Altogether, Kotaku spoke with 10 current and former employees who said that contract workers are basically treated like second-class workers. Contractors are cycled through on 11-month contracts with a mandatory two-month break in between. If you've ever been a permalancer or a contract worker, you're probably familiar with these types of shenanigans. And according to these reports by Axios, Kotaku, and IGN, Nintendo has hundreds of contractors who fill out product testing roles, customer service, localization, and lots of other departments. Also, according to these reports, that contract labor force is completely demoralized and growing increasingly dissatisfied with the way they're being treated at Nintendo. The Kotaku article goes on to highlight testimonies from employees who worked between five to 10 years as contractors who felt like they were strung along by the possibility of full-time employment that never became a reality. Making matters worse is the disparity between the way that contract workers and full-time employees are treated. IGN's report by Kat Bailey describes two separate office buildings at Nintendo's Redmond, Washington campus. The main building is for full-time employees with red badges or red badgers. The other is a repurposed warehouse building which houses mainly blue badge carrying contractors. It's almost cliche how the main building is described as an ultra modern facility while across the way many of the contract workers are quote toiling away on outdated equipment and software with software that looks like it's running on Windows XP and a database that dates back to the 90s. The Kotaku article paints an even more vivid picture in which contract employees said they are allowed to eat lunch at the Mario Cafe but are expected not to linger in the main building. Due to the secrecy of Nintendo's products and the bureaucracy between full-timers and contractors, there's a rule that blue badges aren't usually permitted to be in the main building without a red badge escort. In addition to this, there are a number of other benefits and perks on the Nintendo campus that just aren't available to contractors. In one example, an employee slipped on some ice and hit her head while she was walking to work, and once she got into the office, she had trouble reading, so she was concerned that she may have a concussion. There's an on-site clinic in her building, but she was turned away because she wasn't a full-time employee and wasn't part of the Nintendo health insurance plan. Now, she asked a friend who happened to be a full-time coworker to drive her to a nearby urgent care facility, but because she's technically employed by the contractor staffing agency, she was told it was against company policy for her colleague to drive her off-site. And eventually an Uber was called. This may be one extreme example, but there are multiple accounts across the IGN and Kotaku articles that exhibit contract workers feeling mistreated or unacknowledged at Nintendo. One employee said, you can work next to someone side by side for 20 years and not get invited to the company cookout. This was echoed further in the IGN piece where an employee explained, there was a new section on the internal webpage we were encouraged to look at that showed all of these events and activities and benefits, like a sizable Christmas bonus that we simply weren't allowed to participate in. It's said another. The idea of being hired full-time is like a carrot on a stick to keep you dealing with the mistreatment. Some of that mistreatment includes low pay, intense micromanagement, excessive surveillance, and harsh reprimands for speaking up about any concern employees might have. It's basically created a culture of fear where contractors are afraid of making any missteps which might harm their already very slim chances of being promoted or hired as a full-time employee. It's gotten so bad that employees started using household items to hold down the insert key on their keyboard to prevent an idle or away message from popping up in their messaging apps. As one employee described it, it was like Homer with the bird, except I didn't cause any problems at the nuclear plant. You couldn't even really go to the bathroom without someone noticing you were away from your desk. Another employee told IGN in areas like customer support, the attendance policy is so strict that it's possible to be fired for missing three days of work. As for landing that coveted full-time position at Nintendo of America, an employee referred to as Jen attempted for years, but finally gave up after being declined the role. According to the story, she had been earlier forced to return home in the midst of the interview process due to the death of her sister, leading the 
interviewer to tell her that she had attendance issues. What's worse is Jen says that if that hadn't happened, she would have been content to work for Nintendo for her entire life. It was only after finding a job that paid three times as much for much less work that she was able to kind of reflect on her situation. You don't know that you live on the death planet until you leave the death planet, she explained. After my 10 years there, I was very disappointed at the end. I was very disappointed that I didn't get the dream job. I would have worked for Nintendo forever if I could. I loved it there. I loved the job. I was a Nintendo fan. I've finished every single Legend of Zelda game. And that's kind of the gist of it right there, isn't it? It's easy to replace contract workers at a place like Nintendo because there are plenty of applicants waiting in the wings, fueled by their passion for the games, for the company, that they might not mind so much that they aren't being paid enough or that they are doing the same work or more than their full-time counterparts. Now, that's all well and good if, you know, some individuals want to put themselves in that situation for the opportunity, but if that person later on decides that they actually want to start a family or have a career, you know, at the company, it just doesn't seem like it's possible. And that's particularly frustrating if Nintendo themselves are saying like, hey, you know, come be a contractor for us. There's a possibility, you know, down the road that you be could become full-time. So you stick around with the company, you know, thinking that th this is your way forward. And that's disingenuous, just straight out. Now, without even considering fairness between employment statuses, between, you know, being a contractor or being a full-time employee, a large majority of the contract workers in QA are a crucial part of game development and directly responsible for helping Nintendo games reach, a, you know, that bar of quality that they're kind of known for. So to ever really only acknowledge those workers through reprimands or write-ups about attendance or, you know, speaking up about particular issues that affect your work seems particularly villainous. Now, I know for this video, there's likely going to be some rabble in the comments saying, you know, if people are unhappy with their working conditions, they should just leave, go find another job. And while that's, you know, totally an option, what I'm trying to say is that I think by doing that, what's really happening is it just opens the door for a company like Nintendo to continue to mistreat and exploit an even more willing workforce. Also, if you contextualize these complaints with what's going on in the world outside of games, we are seeing a lot of labor movements against companies like Starbucks and Amazon. So it makes sense that Nintendo contractors are starting to get fed up enough that they're willing to speak out. It's pretty unprecedented actually. Due to the secrecy and respect people have with regards to Nintendo, usually nothing to very little escapes those Halls. However, if you've seen a lot of takes from former Nintendo of America president Reggie fils lately, it's because he wrote a book. IGN happened to be doing an interview with Reggie about his book at the same time they were putting together the investigative piece. So they asked him about the disparity between contract and full-time employees. He replied, at this point, I'm three years retired from Nintendo of America and I can't comment on what's going on today within the company. What I can say is that while I was there, we routinely hired contract employees in as permanent employees. And interestingly, if you look at a number of well-known personalities within Nintendo of America, a lot of them started as contract employees 10, 15, or 20 years ago. He added, So I've read the same stories, this division between contract and full-time employee. All I can say is that is not at all the culture that I left as I retired from Nintendo. Now, maybe this is kind of easy for Reggie to say in hindsight. I also want to note that some of the testimonies within the IGN and Kotaku stories would have come from an overlapping timeline when Reggie was still at Nintendo. So maybe it's hard to say how aware of these issues he would have actually been being so high up the corporate ladder. Basically, I think a lot of these types of issues are likely stamped out at the mid-management level or, you know, through the third-party uh, contractor management agency, which is responsible for kind of uh, hiring and handling some of the HR for these roles. And look, I know it's a lot easier to hear about these types of stories and complaints when it's Ubisoft or Activision, given their history. And in this case, the allegations and criticisms, at least at this point, aren't necessarily as alarming as the stuff we tend to hear about sexual abuse or harassment in the industry, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be concerned. Videos and stories like this aren't made to make people feel bad about liking Nintendo or liking Nintendo games, but I do think it's important that we realize the context and the conditions in which our favorite video games are being made under, and then across the board, push for things to be better however we can. Now, as a consumer, that's not always an easy or even a possible task, but sometimes it's as simple as sharing a video or a story for awareness or actively supporting a developer who you know is looking to make changes with their parent company. All right, that's it for today. If you're interested in this topic, definitely go and read the full IGN story and the full Kotaku story. There's a lot of framing and context in there that I didn't include in this video uh, that just may you know, help you be educated about the situation at large. Uh, and yeah, feel free to share your thoughts in the comments. Thanks everyone for watching and we'll catch you on the next video right here on Inside Gaming.